Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Brad Olson. It's my third talk here. I was on the UFO panel last night. We touched upon briefly a little bit of uh, some history that's not being fully reported to all of us. This uh, being one of those subjects that I find near and dear. Some of you think I'm tall, but uh, <laughs> what if that was me? I'd be a little guy. <laughs> yeah, so th this is an interesting chart. I'm going to talk about half of these. Um, and we can always come back to this. This one here in Turkey, very famous find. This guy was actually a Caesar in Rome. This is the size of Goliath in the Bible. Um, Og, we might touch on him. This is one uh, near Lucerne, Switzerland. This one in uh, Valence, beside a river in France. Another one in France. And a Carthaginian uh, around the Bosporus region. So this is uh, a meme on the internet I saw a couple years ago. And it seems quite uh, unbelievable, quite shocking that if uh, this is all of us, that they could have some that size. But is it? Because my premise is we're looking at planet Earth being a habitable planet for literally millions of years. And if you've ever seen the show Ancient Aliens, maybe one or two of you, yeah. I've never heard of it. Uh, they like to bring up the idea that there have been visitors here in prehistory. And I would propose what I'm going to show you here are some of those uh, finds. And I'm also going to show you how they're not really human, some of them, especially the real big ones, will have double rows of teeth, an extra digit, and just by the sheer size, clearly not human, or anything we know of human. I cover it here in my book, uh, Modern Esoteric. I invite you all to uh, come to my table after this talk. And the first uh, part of this book is about the antediluvian civilizations and the real history of this planet that we're not being told about. So just consider the many varieties of giants here and how different sized ones could have existed at different times than the others. I mean, we're talking about millions of years of this planet being habitable. And these guys could have lived quite long, much longer than us, maybe in the several hundreds of years. Let's go on to the next one. So this is an interesting little uh, meme that I found. <laughs> this little video here, you can see the size of him. Well, I did a little digging on this guy, and it turns out he is in the historic record. There are several shots of him with the Japanese royal family. And this uh, film clip was originally posted on WikiLeaks, of all places. And these other historical uh, still images show him as a pretty famous sumo wrestler back in 1890. So, of course, if you try to go to snoops.com, they'll tell you it's a hoax. And the reason why they say it's a hoax, the only reason they just throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one, they say it, uh, that, that, that there was no video in 1890. Well, they obviously didn't do much homework because the first rudimentary videos, as this one does appear to be, came out around that. You can see the guy on the horse there. This guy is huge. So just to give you an idea of the size of these guys, a lot of people were suggesting this could be an Anunnaki, perhaps from below the world, perhaps from above the world. Let's go to the next one. So uh, one of the other things I talk about are the dwarves. And I'm going to expand this talk for Contact in the Desert next year and include more of the dwarves. And, I, and as I start uh, looking into this, finding more and more stuff. So here you can see a 19th century diagram of the many different human and human-like skulls discovered over 100 years ago. Uh, some of them are not so uh, <laughs> PC to call someone a Bushman or a Negro anymore. But you can see by the skull shapes that many of these look quite exotic. And on the left is the diminutive Flores man, who is just over three foot tall. 
full grown man this tall. Not a dwarf, not any kind of abnormality. And the, uh, the journal Nature came out with this study in April of this year about the Flores man. And this little guy in Flores, if you don't know, is an island in Indonesia, not too far away from uh, the island of Java and the capital of Jakarta. And this Flores man, what's so terribly interesting about all this is for the very first time, a officially sanctioned journal such as Nature has come out and said, this is not related to humans. This is not off the branch that we came from. It came off the branch of Homo habilis, which was a long, long time ago, and it's pretty much an extinct line, just as the Flores man was, what is now extinct. So literally half the size of modern humans, men and women, quite small. So perhaps these giants and dwarves uh, could be these mere side branches of humanity that once lived on Earth, but for some reason just became extinct. There had been giants living all over the world, which I'm going to show you today, and according to the Bible, but despite that assertion, the Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, etc., etc., and any of the officially sanctioned archaeological expedition teams uh, between the whole lot of them have supposedly not been able to cough up one single solitary bone fragment. I'll show you that they're obviously really bad at looking or just want to conveniently sweep this aside. Quick question? Well, it's a really a comment. I think they're, they're the ones covering it up. Well, they are. They are. It's called Smithsonian Gate in this country. <laughs> they have been very guilty of disposing of many priceless artifacts as well as very large men. So these fragments could very well be, especially the tall ones, the evidence of the Nephilim, these giants in the Bible. And it makes one wonder if the elite controlled academic mainstream uh, has covered up something else. Let's go to the next one. So according to a scientific report filed by a team of anthropologists digging near Kigali, Rwanda, in Central Africa, up to 200 of these guys, you see a couple of them pictured here, were uh, entombed for five centuries. They think they're about 500 years old. So that's not really that long, but they were unearthed in 2011. And this is actually uh, one of the few that does have a lot of backing that this, is, this was an authentic find. <laughs> Upon the discovery of these giants, the village elders urged people to flee, and some women were running, screaming with their babies in their hands, clutching their infants. Uh, but the African find is only the latest in the string of alien bodies stretching back some 70 years in this part of Rwanda, Africa. Uh, there are only two or three confirmed real photos from this dig that escaped from being hidden from the public, but they were secretly leaked by some of the archaeologists working on this site. Because sometimes, like with uh, UFO-related things, there's some people that are just like, you know, we worked really hard on this. This is a game changer. We're not just going to let you guys take all the evidence and blow this off. It's not right. So in the same way, there are archaeologists who are whistleblowers. Let's go to the next. Of course, these giants, as I maintain, were pretty close to being the NFLE. You can see how large that head is. This is like a 12 to 15 <coughs> footer. But it's being kept secret because it would interfere with the lies and the fake myths of the history that we're told is the way the world is. Obviously, these giants would not fit so conveniently in that model. We would have to start to rethink everything. Uh, and But th this is not fake. These are not Photoshop, no camera tricks, not the so-called forest perspective. Let's go to the next one. So here's a friend of mine, Michael Tellinger. Some of you might know him. Uh, he was at Contact in the Desert last year. We had some great conversations. Uh, and I'll tell you some of the things he told me. This is a uh, footprint. You see uh, five big toes. The kid's about three and a half, four feet tall. And the really amazing thing, you can only catch a little bit at the very top there, 
is the way that the mud sort of, when you step in thick mud and you release your foot, kind of kicks up a layer above it. Uh, I was just on Beyond Belief with George Norrie, we talked about this. Uh, one of the producers for Gaia TV saw my talk at Contact in the Desert, they flew me out in July. That video just came up two weeks ago. We actually have a video of Michael Tallinger uh, discussing this footprint. But uh, so this footprint, he says, is many thousands of years old, and there are several other of these footprints, but strangely, they aren't talked about, not too much. U.S. government supported historical museums or sites that just get blown off. Because these giants are highly marginalized, it does not fit into the cookie cutter version of history. So Michael Tallinger, and on the right there, I'm going to show you another picture of this. That's a finger bone he's holding. And I told Michael, I'm like, I got a picture of you in my slideshow lecture. Tell me about that finger bone. He's like, oh, it's amazing. There are tendons in it, veins. It, it's uh, very much fossilized, but you can still see the bones in it and the fingernail up there on the top. He also told me that uh, Klaus Donna did DNA tests on a bone from Ecuador, a giant bone, and determined it to be a giant and different DNA to humans. When I did this talk in Contact in the Desert, Jacques Vallee, father of UFO, he was in the audience. I'm like, oh boy, I better get this right. And he did ask a great question, which was, is there any DNA findings on this? And right after that, at, at a breakfast, I saw Michael Tellinger, and he told me about Klaus Donna, and I've looked him up, and he's one of my Facebook friends, and I communicated with him on this. And they found that they're not human. They are not. They're different. So let's go on. We're going to take a little tour around the world. We're going to start here in Egypt, and I'm going to show you some really uh, rare hieroglyphics. And again, there's a bit of an Egypt gate surrounding some of this stuff. Some of these uh, ancient giant humans could be depicted as the Nephilim. You'll see in some of these, uh, some are much, much bigger than that. The big guy on the right there, he's sitting down, and the other two are standing up. So these, uh, they were the Nephilim that the Genesis uh, spoke of in the Bible called the giants among men. And that's a quote from the Bible. These giants, humans' existence is really undeniable. There were also giant black humanoids in the Anunnaki that were the kings and queens of Egypt, and they were huge. Titans of ancient past that are part of the Anunnaki, and uh, Anu was a giant as well. Let's go to the next one. These ancient, uh, oftentimes, they do appear to be African descent, uh, and it very well could be that, 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 that perhaps they were more dark skin. They could be ancient black Egyptians, which could have helped the Anunnaki build many of the Egyptian monuments. And I'll show you, uh, along with some of these pictures, some of them doing the heavy lifting, some of them doing the work. You see kind of a little guy down here, a uh, much bigger guy, uh, yeah. <laughs> getting those bricks up. Uh, so it could be that they helped uh, do the construction there too. Um, Many of them were regarded as royalty, but it's possible that some were of a working class or they just needed some big guys to do the heavy lifting. I know that feeling. <laughs> hey, you're tall. You want to help me move my apartment this weekend? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, not like I had any plans. <laughs> you know, it's something they, uh, often, we often get recruited for. Let's go on to the next one there, Alan. So these... Uh, Egyptologist tales. Here is what it takes for a whole bunch of us puny little humans to move a smallish kind of block. And they're struggling with it, even using wheels. Uh, this might be proof that it's impossible for humans to move a 10 foot by 10 foot block of stone without modern machinery. Uh, let's go to the next one. Here's that giant mummified finger I was telling you about. And it's 38 centimeters long. That's 13.8 inches. And it was discovered in Egypt. Now just imagine, according to official calculations, 
this human or alien who owned this finger, if you piece together his body, would have been at least 20 feet tall. That's 6.3 meters. I'm just over two meters, so that's over three of me. We're looking at close to that ceiling in height if we were to attach a body to that finger bone. Now there's an interesting backstory to this because this mummified limb is not available for public view unless you got some of those uh, Egyptian dollars. And you can actually see, this is an Egyptian note right here, which is a little bit fatter but about as wide as our US dollar. So uh, that should give you an idea that this little part of the finger is as big as one of the dollar bills in your pocket. So this, this picture of this amazing finger was taken by a lucky photographer named Gregor Spori, who paid enough money out in this oasis area of Egypt to get a picture of it. He was a nature-loving doctor. He went on an expedition to Egypt in order to search for this finger. We all know it's out there, and he eventually uh, got a chance to see it in 1988. Although the pictures were taken in 1988, they haven't been published till just uh, the last year or two. This is just coming out now. And, um, and you might ask, why is that so? Well, the answer is quite simple. Every human scientist who saw the photo said that there is no room for giants in our current scheme, uh, be it evolutionary or not. Since the never before seen artifact does not fit well with the already established and documented theories, it could therefore not be real. Just imagine how many other discoveries have been swept under the rug simply because they were inconvenient for our modern theories of human evolution and the ascent of our species. So this giant necklace, look at what he's wearing up there. Look, look who's uh, putting on his uh, wristband jewelry. They had, at one time, displayed in the Egypt Museum some of these jewelry artifacts, which would have just draped over anybody. They've since pulled them out. This is what I'm talking about with Egypt Gate. This is part of it. But again, they're very well renowned for covering up anything that doesn't fit with their pharaonic model. But it does show this giant wearing one of the necklaces that the humans are making and putting on for him. This jewelry is now hidden, but look at the size difference. It's just huge. Let's go to the next. So this is a very interesting spot. Look, this is at Abu Ghraib in Egypt. Uh, they almost look like they're, they're wash basins. Nobody really knows what these blocks are for, uh, but they're expertly carved. And I'm friends with some of the people on Ancient Aliens, including David Hatcher Childress and a, a few other people. And they've often talked about this on the show, that carving a perfect bowl, machining it, is extraordinarily difficult to get such a perfectly round, bowl-like shape. So these were found buried in the sand just until the last few de decades, and uh, they got lined up by the archaeologists and thought they should be in this order. They not necessarily were in that order. But they, um, <clears throat> they appear to be large basins for giant humans, almost like uh, the men's room and the ladies' room. Splash your face, you can see the size of a person there. Way too big, it would almost be like a, a little kiddie pool for that person. But here they are, these, these massive bowls that are so perfectly uh, rendered, especially the bowl shape, so difficult to tool. And some of this uh, may also prove levitation technology, or just the strength of giant humans to move these giant blocks in different places. Let's go to the next. Some more evidence of uh, giant humanoids building some of the structures. This is one of the most amazing structures in ancient Egypt. It's right there on the Giza Plateau. It's called the Osirian in Abydos, and it displays megalithic rock construction. And megalithic means massive stones. And a question often poised on ancient aliens is, why do you have to go so big? Why do you need a block almost as long as this room 
when smaller blocks can do the job just the same. Seems like they might uh, be holding out for something and uh, maybe wanted to leave a message for antiquity. So uh, these, these giants, uh, I mentioned they're spoken of in the Bible, they're also spoken of in Sumerian text. The work of uh, Zachariah Shitkin and others. He calls them the uh, Elohim, Elohim, which are angelic beings, the ones known as angels in the Bible, as some interpret it. And as the Sumerian text goes, uh, the humans had rebelled against Anu and had sex with human women, but the children were born, and some of them did grow into giants. And many of the Nephilim died by the ancient flood, or could have been a pole shift, some kind of big cat catastrophic event that occurred on this planet about 12 to 15,000 years ago when continents shipped, Atlantis went down, others came up, and the continents moved around. So it could be that many of these Nephilim who did live on this planet died in such catastrophic remains. And it's interesting that many of their skeleton remains are now found in Africa, which is the cradle of the birth of humanity. And it could very well be where many of these giants live. So let's go on. The forbidden history of ancient Egypt in, giant, uh, in, in Egypt is these giant humans, these Nephilim giants. Uh, just think of the pharaohs of Egypt as, as they could be when, when you go really, really far back, and I think uh, we're looking at history being dated much older than has ever been given credit for. If you're going back perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, you could uh, consider these giants as possibly being kings and queens, maybe of the Anunnaki. And you can see they're smaller, puny humans serving these royalties. Let's go to the next. Uh, yeah, large tools and ancient quarries, enormous tombs. Uh, and then this was one of the slides that I uh, presented Gaia TV. They used it on the episode I was on. Look at that. <laughs> There's no mistaking. This is a very, very large being. Let's go to the next. These are, I, I'm not sure where all of them are found. This is a very rare image. Um, that's a good question. I wish I had documentation on where each one of these are. Some of them are very <laughs> difficult to find, I've been told, and are sometimes even inaccessible. I would probably estimate that uh, many of those, many of the uh, hieroglyphs and those carvings come from the Valley of the Kings including this area. Well, the, uh, Saqqara is actually not too far away from the Great Pyramids. I did a horseback ride from the Great Pyramids to Saqqara. Saqqara is where the Step Pyramid is, the Osara Step Pyramid. And this is the Serapium. And you have these massive granite tombs that had no one in it. Nothing was in it. So the Egyptologists went and said that they must have been or these apis bulls. They just, I think they just made something up because they're so big, they'd be way too big for people. But uh, since the Egyptians had many animals in their pantheon of gods, they just said conveniently, okay, the biggest animal of all, let's put them in the tomb. <coughs> Question, John? Uh, yes, it said that those could potentially be uh, teleportation chambers. Have you heard that before? Oh, uh, I have not, but. Um, Chilchris has actually been down here, and he told me that they that you can actually uh, tap on them, and they, they just vibrate and hum. So they have acoustic properties as well as being just megalithic, massive. And the other thing that's so strange about this place is there's about a dozen or so of these tombs, but there's all these right angle hallways, and this is not the same rock of the bedrock there. This is all underground. So how they even got these in place is just about as mysterious as uh, possibly who did uh, build it or what was used in these tombs. Let's go to the next. Here we see some regular-sized Egyptian labor workers uh, with, 
with giant kings in ancient Egyptian history. No mistake in who's the boss here. <laughs> you got to... Giant kings and queens, perhaps, uh, liked ruling over their small puny servants and would uh, crack out the orders. But maybe there was a working class uh, of Nephilim as well, as I said earlier. Here's a quote from uh, the Bible, Genesis 6-4. There were giants in earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Let's go to the next one. Giant humanoids with regular sized human uh, working side by side once again. Let's go to the next one. This one's really interesting because they're all on the same boat, but some are much bigger than others. Could this just be that the most influential people who are drawn bigger to show that they're more important? It's possible. Uh, Self-aggrandizing the king, but since these occur so regularly, it would seem that they wanted to show their size, wanted to show off in a way. Um, you can see the slaves are less significant and shown uh, doing the hard work of rowing the boat. Let's go to the next one. Here's a giant thigh bone, which was also found in Egypt. It was one of those that I showed you on the first slide. And this being a replica uh, in a museum, which I'm going to tell you more about when we get to America, where this guy named Joe Taylor has found <coughs> as much evidence as he could and put it into a museum in this uh, small town in Texas. This being one of those... Egyptian bones and this giant thigh bone here is a replica found in Egypt. Look at the size of the thigh bone next to the boy there. See how tall it was. Archaeologists who broke, this backstory is an archaeologist broke into a small pyramid in Egypt, claimed to have found a giant buried there, uh, which he ascribed, his words not mine, were alien-like humanoid. Unlike most ancient Egyptians, the cadaver was this, in this case, was not mummified, had no ears or nose. This is, I'm reading to you from the report. Or a very wide mouth and no discernible tongue. Such a body may be explained as being an alien, or perhaps it could have been a giant slave buried alive with his tongue cut out. Uh, as Egyptians were known to do that when a slave or master or mistress died. The corpse was not wrapped nor dressed in a traditional Egyptian burial shroud or garb, but was clothed in an odd metallic tunic. These are the notes from the archaeologist who pulled it out. Its feet were adorned with shoes or slippers that had a look or feel similar to vinyl. Unfortunately, as far as I know, none of that really remains anymore. They too have a, let's go to the next one a way of covering this stuff up in Egypt, too, as we know. More critical evidence of ancient giant Nephilim. Of course, these could be giant aliens, uh, the Nephilim giants. And the reason why their features are a little different from humans is because these Nephilim were half human, half alien, or part angelic, angelic being, which may have caused some kind of mutation. Let's go to the next. I'm going to show you a bunch of coffins. This is really uh, telling. Here's a giant human coffin. It wouldn't have made any sense to place, say, a five foot seven man into a 17 foot plus coffin. And keep in mind, the queens were royalty as well. This is a female, that tall. And if you've ever been to the King Tut exhibit or know about Egyptologists, they often put the corpse within a coffin, within a coffin, within a coffin. It's kind of like those Russian dolls that all fit into each other, much like that. So this would suggest that uh, this queen was three meters tall. That's a full meter taller than me, about as tall as that screen. So that's pretty impressive. And in ancient Kemet, which is the name for Egypt, um, 
The historians have tried to hide this as best they could, but it's really undeniable, especially these giant coffins, which are clearly designed for giant things. Go to the next. The question, why don't they hide it? What's the big deal? The hiding part is hiding the reality of these giants. Now, they may display some of these very large coffins in the Egyptian museum, but they won't show you the mummies. But they, why? Well, that's the whole point of this talk, and let's see if I can answer your question when it's all done. So this, here's another uh, large coffin. So this, uh, that, that three meter tall coffin would have been about uh, nine feet tall. And this information about giant humans is contained in most or almost all of known ancient texts, including the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas, as well as Chinese and Tibetan chronicles, Assyrian cuneiform tablets, as well as writing of the Maya. Let's go to the next one. And again, another giant coffin. Again, a queen. It would have been very, very tall. Uh, let's go to the next one. Here are some giants working alongside regular sized people on the top. This is the last slide I'm going to show you from Egypt. The giant arm as long as the regular people and their legs as wide as regular people, as you can see. This is not a case of perspective, the detail of this wall painting. This is from the tomb of Mena, depicting an agricultural scene with tiny little people. Now below it is, we're going to move to uh, Europe and then the America, but this is from ancient Aztec art. And it would appear the Lilliputians have captured uh, oh. the giant. Yeah. So they're very colorized and detailed, almost like illustrations. Are these remakes, or is this how it looks on the wall? This is how it looks on the wall. And this one, I can verify, comes from Mena. And the other one are uh, drawings usually done by the first Spanish conquistadors. Let's see if I can read this. A group of natives in the central highlands of Mexico, capturing and pulling to death a giant from the Codex Vaticano. Earthian A, something. I can't read exactly what it's from. But so the, the conquistadors would keep journals. They would have illustrators who could draw some of the legends. So it's their revolution, not the Mayan. It's not Mayan, no, it's not Aztec. It was uh, the conquistadors who drew what they were told was their encounter with the uh, Aztecs capturing and killing a giant. Uh, these depictions, um, you know, it doesn't take 16 men to pull a six foot tall man. So this is clearly a giant human. It's not a forced perspective. Look at how many people are tugging on the ropes here. Let's switch. Now we're gonna head over to Europe. So this is the photo of the fossilized Irish giant. You can see Queen Elizabeth there checking it out. And you can also see uh, another very famous mummy, which was uh, taken at a London Rail Depot and appeared in the December 1895 issue of Strand Magazine. That's this guy here, this giant mummy. And the giant was allegedly dug up by uh, Mr. Dwyer while prospecting for iron ore in County Antrium in Ireland. It was 12 foot 2 inches tall, that's 3.71 meters, weighing 2 tons, and had the distinguished six toes. It's too bad we can't see that more clearly, but these are uh, the notes from this magazine article, the Strand Magazine article. Six toes on its right foot. After being exhibited in Dublin, it was brought to England and exhibited in Liverpool and Manchester. At six pence a head, you could go see uh, what is said in the magazine article, attracting scientific men as well as gaping sightseers to come and see this. After a legal dispute over ownership, nothing more appears to have been heard or seen of this exhibit. And the guy on the right, he actually lived in contemporary times. And there is a region in Northern Ireland 
where everybody is seven foot tall or higher. There's still a few of them left, but through interbreeding and so forth, uh, many of them have lost their giant stature. Let's go to the next. So here's an example of a giant skull found in Ohio and one in Denmark. Um, you can see kind of some slight differences, especially the uh, Ohio one. And unfortunately, many of the giants in Europe have been long gone. They've looted the tombs, many of the megalithic dolmens and other burial sites. They've yanked those out from a long time ago. But from North America, what it appears is the migration occurred from Europe, that they crossed the Atlantic, and it's now called the Maritime Archaic Period, where these giants moved westward to the Great Lakes region. Indeed, these giant skeletons are found in large numbers in the state of Pennsylvania and Ohio. Many of those earthen mounds that we know so much about uh, often contain giants, but again, they were looted in the 19th century so many of these have been lost. Um, and North America has the best opportunity to find another one of these still. And I'm talking to uh, Andrew Collins and a few other people that do some work in this regard, and they think they might know of one in a cave in the uh, Great Basin of Nevada. So I said if there's any kind of excavation, get them involved and come out there and uh, help out. So I'm waiting here on that. Wouldn't it be great? We could break a story of a 12-foot giant being found here in North America. Let's go on to the next. So here's this guy, Joe Taylor, at the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum in Crosby Town, Texas. He's got quite a few uh, artifacts on display. Showed you the thigh bone from Egypt. This guy's from Turkey. He was one of them I showed you at the very beginning. And this giant once stood 14 to 16 feet tall and had 20 to 22 inch long feet. Good luck trying to find shoes. <laughs> His or her fingertips with the arms to their sides would have been about six feet above the ground. Biblical record, Deuteronomy 311 states that the iron bed of Og, showed you that guy, King of Bashan, was nine cubits by four cubits, or approximately 14 feet long and six feet wide. That's a big guy. And yeah, maybe they could have had a good career in the NBA. I think I, they might have had to move the net up a bit higher. That would have been too easy to slam dunk. They'd be hitting their chest against it. Um, let's go on to the next. So this is a very famous one. Uh, we're moving on now to North America. I have this in my book, uh, Modern Esoteric. Very famous photo. Uh, made the rounds in the 19th century. These are two archaeologists. This is actually found in California, San Diego region. The Channel Islands that you can see from LA and San Diego. A lot of giants found there. A lot of giants not only with extinct species, including dwarf mammoths, which have been found at a roasting pit under an overhang, long extinct creatures being eaten by these giants who were then buried themselves on the Channel Islands and across on the mainland. The useless attempt to hide these giants is really getting weak. This guy is eight foot four inches tall. It's a mummified body. And I'll show you some other mummies that they found in North America here in a sec. This guy is named Professor McGee, pictured on the left. These ancient giants were the mound builders, as I alluded to before. Their height ranged from 8 to 13 feet tall. Let's go to the next one, Alan. Another case of an archaic type of giant human skull, this one found in Wisconsin. Uh, there's a really great book by Richard Dewhurst called The Giants of Ancient America. And in the book, it's about 450 pages. This is just one of 100 or more examples of headlines from the 19th century, which announced these massive skeletons being found. Let's hit the next one. 
There are many similarities at the giant human skeletons found in the northern Great Lakes region. And those giants, similarity found in northern Europe, all of which were part of this maritime archaic. Let's go to the next one. I'd love to go to this site, the giant's ruins. When I was looking up all these uh, slides trying to verify some of the sites. Indeed, there is a raft trip. This is in southern uh, Indiana, just before it reaches the Ohio River. And there are raft trips you can take to go see the giant ruins. I'm not exactly sure what it was. I couldn't find another uh, image of it. But this is actually from a survey map from the Indiana Geological Survey Map in Crawford County, far southern part of Indiana. Let's go to the next one. This photo is of a lost race of giants found in a burial mound near Lake Delavan. Now this is very close to where I grew up in uh, northwestern Illinois, and my uncle had a summer home not too far from here. This is one of the most clear-cut cases of a team of archaeologists who came out from Beloit College, documented everything as an archaeologist would, started coming up with these bones that included more than 200 effigy mounds at Lake Delavan and proved to be classic examples of what they thought were 8th century woodland culture. But the enormous size of these skeletons and these elongated skulls, this picture taken in 1912, did not fit with anyone's concept of a textbook standard because they were so enormous. These were not the average human beings. Many believe the Smithsonian scientists are trying to cover this up, specifically the Smithsonian Institute, which has been accused of making a deliberate effort to hide the telling of the bones, they called it, and to keep the giant skeletons locked away. There are also accusations that many giant bones were just simply dumped into the Atlantic Ocean in the 19th century in order to cover it all up. Let's go to the next. We're struck by the following traits. Here you can see the double rows of teeth, which is characteristic. But in North America, they have been able to find several traits of some of these giants. When I was doing my book called Sacred Place in North America, I was going out to Lovelock Cave. It's another location called Spirit Cave uh, in northwestern Nevada, where some of these mummified giants with red hair were found. And they started to piece together some of their uh, religious history. They seem to have worshipped a mother goddess religion. They used copper, but not bronze axes. They used polished slate tools, including fishing plummets, which were apparently regarded as sacred. They had a belief that the grandmother moon was the repository of souls. Uh, their diet emphasized shellfish, for which the double row of teeth probably were selected as an evolutionary advantage in their beachcomber origin out of Africa. There's a question mark on there, but that's what the double teeth were for. They could just bite into an abalone shell and crack it and get to the meat. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, they were builders of fish weirs in North America, the river to trap migrating eels, which is kind of like a dam. And certain, they had certain vegetarian habits, including wild rice, for instance. Sometimes there are wild rice uh, groves where you can still find some habitation of where these giants had once lived. There are left behind inscriptions on artifacts, especially pipes often buried with the dead. They use coal and petroleum to make fires and they were weaving and using looms. They had knowledge of seafaring, mathematics, and engineering, including building canals and irrigation. Uh, they've seen the bearing of a dog with a child to guard later in the past life, so another similarity to Egypt, that they would uh, believe that a companion like a dog would uh, travel along with the deceased master into the afterlife. A language apparently Afro-Asiatic and close to the Semitic tongue. And king crab. Nobles were buried in seated positions on thrones surrounded by a courtier 
of their retainers. And I remember when I read Richard Dewhurst's book, it was example after example after example. A giant king and sometimes smaller humans all buried together. That's a co pretty common uh, custom. We see that in China, we see it in Asia and Egypt, that sometimes you would take all your servants with you when you died. And apparently the giants did that too. Let's go to the next. So these skulls belong to uh, and represent an unknown pre-modern human or humanoid types. These are two of the most famous examples. The top one is called the Star Child Skull. There was a man named Lloyd Pies, deceased a few years ago. He used to travel around with this Star Child Skull, and indeed they have done genetic testing on it, as well as the Paracas Peru skulls and found that the DNA does not match humans. It looks like they had mated with humans, but were not quite uh, of our DNA. And so what's interesting about these uh, Paracas skulls, you can see the outline of a human skull here and a human skull here. Now there are cultures that will map the skull, that will wrap it, that will deform it, but you cannot increase size. You just can't. And these are 30% larger cranial capacity than humans. You just can't bend the skull any way to increase the skies. It's impossible. So these are clearly entities that are not human. Why do they have to be entities? Sorry. What do you mean? Well, what would you call them? Isn't an entity someone considers that? No, we're entities no, no, no. too. We're all entities. You're an entity, and so am I. I'm just saying it's an example of a non-human type humanoid. Let's call them that. Let's go to the next one. Okay, here's another one of these elongated skulls from Paracas, Peru. This one is called the Hayakwai skeleton. You can see that uh, the skull is just so abnormally large. And this is a juvenile body in a fetal position. Must have been a, a child who died quite young, mummified, buried, and finally recovered. Let's go to the next one. So now I'm going to show you a little twist of the story. And I want to start with some of these, these maps. And this is a map of uh, South America. You can see some of the data points connecting up. And this is called the Piri Reese map of 1519. And some of the liner notes, which got cut off in here, say that it was a source map. It was drawn from a source map, which means another map found in the library of Alexandria, who had knowledge of the Americas and quite possibly Antarctica before the ice. And how could a map drawn in 1519 be able to accurately depict the Americas uh, and, and possibly Antarctica itself. So some of the islands off Antarctica that are depicted on this map were not even discovered until the earliest, early 20th century. Antarctica as a landmass was not sighted until about 1820 by whalers from Europe who spotted land. Let's go to the next. This is called the Botch map. It's an 18th century map commonly claimed to accurately depict the continent of Antarctica before it was buried in ice. Uh, it has been claimed that the map has evidence that an ancient civilization had mapped Antarctica when it was free from ice and that it was based on this source map that the Botch map was drawn. Uh, made by a French geographer uh, who was traveling along with the French frigate. Full title is The Map of the Southern Lands Contained Between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Antarctic Pole, where the new discoveries made in 1739 to the south of Cape Good Hope may be seen. So you can see a uh, bit of Australia, a bit of Africa, and South America here. Now let's go to the next. Keep an eye on that map. This is how Antarctica really looks. There really is a channel between uh, those land features. It's not quite all a continent at all. Uh, that's how it would look without the ice. So 
it, you know, we were taught that the first landing in Antarctica took place in 1821 by whalers, and they were looking for seals, although they were on shore for less than an hour. These men were the first humans to set foot on this new southern land. Many years later, another survey team discovered the Trans-Antarctic Mountains with a high point of 14,856 feet tall, which is taller than any mountain in the lower 48. And that's located right around here. Huge mountain range straddling right through Antarctica. Let's go again. <coughs> so Antarctica was known centuries before its exploration. Another early map from 18, 1531 by uh, the Finney map. Um, this was an important mathematician who has designed geological maps based on geometric studies of different types of spherical projections. Uh, the map shows around the South Pole a large continent called Terra Australis, which could very well be Australia, but I'll show you why this is important now. Let's go to the next. Because if you were to take what is of the ice and put it on top, it looks remarkably similar to this map in 1531. Keep in mind Columbus came here in 1492, so that's just a few decades after Columbus. And again, nobody was supposed to have set foot in Antarctica until 1821. Let's go to the next. So this is where it gets weird, and here is I'm going to drop the other shoe on all this. <laughs> what is going on down there in Antarctica? You've got pyramids, you can see on top. You've got ancient ruins now that have been said to have been discovered. And quite possibly, go to the next one, a giant spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And this is what all the elite are going down there to see. It's been called the Illuminati Disneyland. Because you have to be of that... Uh, ilk to get in there. So people like uh, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church went. Uh, Prince Harry with some of his uh, SEAL team buddies went cross-country skied out there to see it. This is a three-mile long ship. Supposedly it has a computer on there they're working on, a supercomputer they're trying to figure out. And in many ways um, this large modern ship crash landed on the surface of the Antarctic continent when it was still ice free. David Wilcock wrote about this, that the ship is now buried beneath over three miles of glacial ice. And when it crash landed in Antarctica, it was all tropical land at the time. What's more, crushed remains of palm, pineapple, and other such trees can still be find, found beneath the giant a gigantic and hugely impressive craft. And it's way ahead of our time in our current accepted technology that this should even exist, clearly showing ET contact here uh, on Earth. This scientific breakthrough will go from analyzing and reverse engineering to hearing what is on this ship, could give us an incredible leap forward in technology. Let's go to the next. And now we come full circle. Because what else they found down there? You guessed it, the giants. <laughs> These are depictions by Corey Good. He actually said he saw them. He's been to some of these archeological digs. Here you can see megalithic buildings, quite like the Assyrian in Egypt I showed you earlier. They're pulling out a woolly mammoth. And these pre-Adamite giants with Look at the heads, look at those heads. Not human-like at all. So, Brad, Brad yeah. I, I apologize. Uh, uh, how long have you been in the room? Yeah, I got a late start, because there was still another group. I and we got about five minutes ago. I'm doing a dinner for Jordan here, and the hotel wants to set up this room. Five minutes. Room. Let me check We're here. about to wrap up here. Five minutes. Five minutes. Really, seriously, I'm almost done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And now for something completely different. And so we have this, uh, we've now, advances in technology have allowed right. ice. Right. Right. The next one right. is empty if you guys want to do it, but there's no projection. Five minutes. No, David, we're almost done here. Okay, thank you. 
uh, reveal the coordinates of monolithic structures below the Antarctic ice, and these are now being excavated in what I call, uh, commonly called the Illuminati Disneyland of Antarctica, complete with these pre-Adamic Adamite giants, uh, the new name for it. So they come from before the time of Adam uh, in the Bible, and these giants, depicted by Corey Good, have a distinct Egyptian flair in their dress. Uh, he says that they are from these ancient ET saucers, and they, they are 12 foot tall, 12 fingered, 12 toes, dual sets of teeth, and red haired Nephilim frozen into the ice shelf. Sound familiar? <laughs> I think there might just be one more slide, so we could be really close to being done. Yeah, okay, here we are. That's the end. Thank you guys very much. Two books. The third one is on the way, probably a 2019 release, and I can, uh, well, I think we ought to get out of here. If you guys want to come and join me at my table in the so where's main the hall, hall there, we can Where's the Hollow this. Earth compared to the maps that you were Say again? Where's the Hollow Earth or the opening with it you were posted? The Hollow Earth, I mean, I, I could have talked about a lot. Of, I could have done a whole talk on it very quick, quite frankly. Yeah, a lot, a lot of weird stuff going on down there. My, my understanding of the Hollow Earth, but I think they got set up uh, when they were going going down the caves. They actually yeah. went through the portals, yes. right? Let's take and the through the portals, they ended up in this the, big old yeah, yeah, like yeah. cave spaces. That was like, oh, the Earth is all just one piece. Yeah. Right. But there's also, is, and there's also just, theory that Antarctica just actually went into a different dimension. Oh, actually, that's a great question.